podcasting from the great city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the first official capital city of these great United States. This is the TeacherCast Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Jeff Bradbury, and welcome to another episode of the TeacherCast Podcast from TeacherCast.net. The TeacherCast Podcast is a weekly show where we discuss the 21st century technologies that teachers need to utilize in their 21st century classrooms. Today we're going to be looking at Google+. Google+, is a free service that was released in beta at the beginning of the summer and will be released to the world very soon. Today we have a very special guest with us to tell us all about Google+. We're going to be talking about how to use Google Plus in our classroom for both a teaching tool and as a great communication device with our students and parents. He's going to show us how to use Google Plus to create some very fun video conferencing projects, and he will show us how we as teachers can use Google Plus and Google Docs to have a great working relationship in our classroom. Most importantly, we will discuss how to use Google Plus safely in our classrooms to best protect our students from getting into trouble. I'd like to welcome a very good friend of mine on the program today. He is the host of the podcast Google Plus Today, which can be found on iTunes. I'd like to introduce Dennis Freitas to the program. Dennis, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. How are things out in California today? It's hot. That's why I'm sitting up in my office with my brand new air conditioner, and it's blowing 64 degrees in here, so it feels really good up here. Oh, man, that's got to be great out there in California. 64 degrees... Well, it's 90 outside. It's 64 in my recording studio. We have, we have uh, four Macs in here with about six monitors, and I can't touch the machines half of the time because we have so much video burning. So I had to get an external air conditioner just to keep the, stu- the studio cool. <laughs> that, that is awesome. We're sitting here in Philadelphia today, and it's 89 degrees, and they're calling for thunderstorms the rest of the week. Oh, great weather. So uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about Google Plus Today. Uh, Sure, you bet. You know, uh, Google Plus Today has been going on for about a month. And I got released, I got accepted into the beta in uh, June 29th. And when I first opened it up, we had a non-disclosure agreement for the first three days. We couldn't discuss it until the first couple days in July. When I opened it up, I said, wow, this is really going to revolutionize the Internet, and it's going to take social networking to a whole new level. So immediately I thought, you know, I probably ought to get my ducks in a row, and I really like to talk about this to the people and share what, what I know about it uh, through a podcast and through screencasts, which my background, obviously, with your Mac show and your Mac network, I do a lot of uh, teaching and education on how to use your Macs. So when I got into Google+, Plus, I said, this is absolutely going to just change everything. So we started a podcast. Uh, I started using Google+. Plus. We immediately had a few guests on, and we had just normal people on. That was really the exciting part at the beginning, was just to get people's thoughts and how they're using it. And it just kind of took off from there. We now do on-screen tutorials. We're recording Hangouts. We do quick tips. We've even announced all things Google because so many people, uh, their initial entrance into Google Plus was their entrance into Google in general. So they didn't even have a G Plus account or a Google uh, Gmail account, I should say. So they don't have any idea what to do with all the things that are available from Google. So we're really just kind of attacking Google all together in this uh, network we've created. So we've had a lot of people come on the show lately and they've been talking about Google Plus, um, but they're really not sure what it is. I mean, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, and, and they think, oh, Google Plus is just another one of those, get me away from it. I don't want it, but you kind of have a different opinion. What is Google Plus? Well, I'll tell you the, a couple things here. And the main thing about Google Plus is it's not necessary. And I say that to a lot of people, and they, they give me this blank stare. Well, Google has so many other things like we just talked about. They have Gmail. They have Google Docs. They have Google Voice. They have the Reader. Just so many things that Google has in their back end that they don't need a social network. Where Facebook and Twitter, all they offer is that social network. So this doesn't need to drive income to, to Google. So it's a very unique uh, s- 
social situation where they don't need to to make money off of this. So they're going to offer the best experience they can and bring people to use other aspects of Google. Now, so I see that part of it. But also what I see in Google Plus is they spent two years researching what Twitter did, what Facebook did, what MySpace did, what LinkedIn has done, and combined all those into one package. And they've done it flawlessly. And you have to remember, it's still in beta. It's only five weeks old, and things are just getting started. But they did it right from the beginning. So you, when you first launch Google+, Plus, it's a little bit intimidating. You look at it and you think, well, okay, it's a stream – just like you would see on your wall in Facebook. But the stream is you have so much control, where in Facebook, you just get everybody's posts. With the addition of circles, and and my two favorite things to discuss when I talk about Google+, is circles and hangouts. With the ability to put people in circles, you can narrow down who you want to view and who you want to look at and who you want to see their posts. So the circles are a huge addition. And, of course, hanging out, which if people that don't understand what hangouts are, it is a 10-person video conference live, which is free, by the way. Usually you have to pay for that kind of thing. And you're able to hang out with 10 of your friends, coworkers, or even in an interview situation where if you're looking for somebody to do work for you, you bring in nine other people, including yourself. You're the 10th person, and you can have an open discussion forum with 10 people. It's just very well done from the beginning. So if I wanted to implement Google Plus or some of the Google Plus features into my classroom, um, I guess I would need to have an account. Would my students need to have an account too? Yes, they would. And uh, immediately when we started talking about this, Jeff, pre-show, my thought is that you know there is an age limit. You have to be 18 years old, I believe it is, to have a Google Plus account. So that might be your first stumbling block. Now, since you're in education, they might make an exception for you, or you might have to create multiple Gmail accounts, which can be done. I have four currently, and there's a reason behind that, but I, I'll explain that you know, if you want me to, but it's uh, different accounts for different types of screencasts that I do. So you might have to create a, a specific login for each class, if you will. Can more than one person be on that account on two different computers? They can view it, but they would not be able to interact. So, yes, in order for them to actually – it depends on how exactly you would want to use this. Now, do you want to deliver the information to them or do you want them to interact with you Um, in this setting? You know, let's say I have a lesson to give or I want to have people see my Google Plus content, all of my, say, 20 students or so. That's no problem at all. Anybody can see your stream. It's just a matter of for them to comment or to access to it or anything like that, then they have to have an account. But you you can send them the link to your stream and they'll see it. And what are some of the things that I can put on my stream? Uh, You mean the the wall itself? Yeah. Everything, anything, uh, pictures, videos, uh, links to other websites, location services, um, anything that you wish to – to type, you could put any URL. You know, there's a link tab, for example. Uh, we should probably just go step by step. Sure. So when you when you look at the stream, and if you've never been in Google Plus before, and I, I'm not sure where your audience is as far as their familiarity with Google Plus, but you have your stream, which is a little house logo. Next to that, you have your photos tab. Then you have your circles. Or, or your, your profile, but you have your circles, which is the next most important thing. So say you're in your stream. Within the box that you actually type in, you have a drop down and you have a picture of a camera, a picture of a video box, if you will, a link, and then also a location service. Now, I believe people are under the impression that by adding a link, so if you wanted to add a link to a site you wanted your, your kids to go look at, you would click that link and add it. That's fine, but that's going to create a drop down to an additional link. Just so long as you type in the hyperlink into your stream box, you'll get that link available as well. So you can put in multiple links. 
uh, pretty much the sky's the limit to what you can put in your stream. That's really nice. I mean, I know a yeah. lot of times when I'm going through the internet, I'm finding links and web pages and stuff. I would love to find something that's safe and easy to use that I can just put in one spot and have my kids go to it. Right. And you said, because this is Google, I guess we can put in YouTube videos easily? Well, now the YouTube videos are more in the Hangout feature. And we stumbled around with it a little bit. We've been practicing quite a bit with Hangouts. And I think Hangouts still have a lot of work to be done to them. Um, but you're able to, when you, if you were to start a Hangout, you'll have a chat box which I think where, where it would really benefit you and your students would be to have a hangout. Now you have nine students and yourself. You coordinate the hangout. And you, if you have a predetermined YouTube video on your YouTube channel that you want to share with the kids and then have a Q&A session during it, you can have everybody view the YouTube video. They can be typing in their comments in the chat section. And then you come back and answer questions based on the video you just watched. The only problem is you have to be coordinated. You have to tell everybody to say, okay, we're going to start the YouTube video now and start the YouTube video all at the same time. So it's going to take a little bit of education. And if you were going to use this in a classroom setting, I would highly recommend putting some tutorials together on how to use the Hangouts prior to ever starting a hangout. Hmm. So I think it's just going to create frustration. And you you were in, Jeff, when we did our recording of the hangout mm -hmm. uh, last week. Yes. Well, th that, that taught me so much. And we're starting a series as well all about hangouts. And it's to show exactly what we talked about and how – Everybody has to be on the same page. You can't have somebody in – now Now we're talking about chat uh, hangouts, so we're kind of a little bit all over the place here, but that's generally how podcasts go, <laughs> just by their nature. Um, you have hangouts. You're going to have a chat box. You're going to have your YouTube box, and you're going to have an invite box. The invite box is to allow other people to come in. So if you want to ask other people, you could bring them in. But once you're – your hangout set, you shouldn't need to go back to your invite box. The two key boxes right now currently, and I'm sure they're going to add more, is the chat and the YouTube. So you as the administrator of the hangout would need to control everybody, mute everybody's mics and say, do not unmute yourself because we discovered that they can and say, I'm going to take control of this room right now. Starting from left to right, I need everybody to and you can certainly get their name by hovering over the bottom if you don't know who they are. Everybody start their YouTube channel. So you go to YouTube, you click on that little dialog box and say, start playing the YouTube now. Then you'll all be in sync. Uh, I talked to a Google employee in a, in a Hangout, and that's something else. If you're new to Google+, Plus, Google employees will announce that they're going to have Hangouts with their project managers. And they'll come in and they'll talk to you about these things. I was really baffled, actually. Quite a few of them were stumped by some of the questions mm -hmm. that we had. But they are, again, working on all this stuff, trying to get it a little bit better uh, coordinated. But what I'm seeing on YouTube is not necessarily what your students are going to be seeing on YouTube. The timing is going to be different. So I would say everybody runs through the YouTube. When they're done, then you cue everybody's mics back on or you allow them to – to respond in the chat saying, okay, I have seen the video, and once you get everybody on the same page, you go back and discuss the video. That's probably the best integration for YouTube in a Hangout. So when you're in a Hangout watching the videos, can you still see each other on their screens? No. Okay. Because I'm, no. I'm looking at this as being a great possibility, not only for in the class, but to coordinate with different classrooms, you know, around the school or around the world of everyone's watching that same video and having that conversation, that interaction, that would be amazing to use in the classroom as a tool, being able to watch a single video with somebody, say, out in Nebraska, and everybody could at the end talk about that video or talk about that experience they were having. And I say no. But I, th that's with the asterisk because there is, but you have to add a third-party application. And I didn't know how, how deep you wanted to get into third-party apps, but there are two. One is called ManyCam, and I'll give you the link for the show notes. Mm -hmm. And the other is Cam Twist. 
Now, Cam Twist is, a, is more Mac specific, and, and I'm sure you have people that are on Windows boxes as well as Macs. But ManyCam, M A N Y C A M, allows you to do what you just mentioned. You can do picture in picture, you can do screen sharing. So, for example, if you didn't want to use the built in feature, into Google Plus. And now, so now we're getting out of the Google Plus dynamic and we're getting into a third party app. So you take the ManyCam and you use that as your featured, uh, your featured content. So when you first set up your Hangout, you're going to get an option to use your front facing camera or an additional camera. You select ManyCam, and then when you get to ManyCam, you can share your picture as far as your personal video that you have uh, the camera set up, and you can share a screen at the same time. So your source has become different. So now you play YouTube on your screen, and you're controlling everything that's being seen by the room. You don't have to have all that coordination of the YouTube thing that, that takes place in Google Plus. I see. Does that make sense? That makes sense. That makes okay. sense. And, and Good. We, we can we can post you know some links on how to do that, and we'll of course post in the show notes those those different websites to go. Um, can we go back to the stream real quick? Sure. I, I'm looking at it says share what's new, and if I click on there's a picture of a camera, and I can pick click on the camera, and then it says add photos, mm-hmm. create an album. And I can even update stuff from my phone. So I, I guess if I'm searching, or I guess I should say, if I have a whole bunch of photos that I'd like to post for a specific lesson or a topic, I can create like a gallery. Is that the idea here? Uh, okay. Well, the pictures is a whole nother animal. And you know that th- this is exactly why we created a screencast and podcast just for Google+. <laughs> it's virtually impossible in... You know, I don't know how long how long our show is today, but to explain every aspect of Google Plus in a thirty minute show, we have uh, nearly twenty episodes out now, and there we still haven't even scratched the surface on all the content. We spent three days just talking about what you're talking about, how to create and share photos. So I'm opening up that same tab. So what what Jeff's talking about for those of you who are not following along here is in the stream, you'll see what we mentioned earlier, a little camera. When you click on the camera, it says add photos, create an album, and from your phone. If you notice, when you click from your phone, it immediately takes you to that you have to have the Google Plus app for iOS or the Android app. So that is something that is separate altogether. Now, if you don't have an Android phone or you don't have an iOS phone, that doesn't apply to you at all. So the next thing would be to add photos or create an album. Once you click add photos, it brings you into your file structure of your computer and you're able to upload photographs from your hard drive. And then finally, the last tab, which says create an album, that allows you to drag multiple pictures from your computer into, or you can select them the same way, and you have a title dialog at the top. Usually it defaults to the current date, and it says album name. So you could change, you know, change it to Jeff's Classroom. And then you put all these pictures in that particular album. Now, when it comes to sharing photos, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. You either have to share an entire album, or in order to, if you want to share a particular picture, you have to do it through another application called Picasa which is built into Google Apps under the More tab. Okay. So I, I know we're getting a little advanced, but it's, it's very difficult to talk very, you know, specific uh, when it comes to Google+, because there is so many new things that people don't get it yet. They don't understand, uh, especially if they don't have an invite. They'll have no idea what we're talking about right, right now. Right. Um, I think that what you really need to do, and I don't want to promote my own website, but you need to find somebody that's doing screencasts and videos and podcasts about Google Plus and start viewing those as well, and then you'll get a better handle. Or since you're somewhat of a pseudo expert on this particular topic, Jeff, and you're going to be you're going to be using this in your classroom, correct? I'm going to try to use it in my classroom. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that you can be the one to coordinate everybody now. So does your classroom setting have everybody with a computer in front of them? Is it a computer lab? You know, where I teach, I have a really nice Mac lab, um, about 24 Macintoshes. And uh, I'm hoping that the domain is unlocked, that we can use them in the school this year. Okay. So then uh, would this be more for after school or would this be during the class? Well, I teach a music theory class, and I'm trying to figure out how to best utilize things. You know, um, one of the things we'd like to talk about in a, coming up here is you know how to integrate Google Docs and and what can you do to merge those two things. Um, I just happen to be a, a Google Docs fanatic, and and you know my spreadsheets are up there. I sometimes put PDFs up there on my you know to to save my files. I guess we can integrate Google Docs and and Google Plus together. Can we post that stuff on the stream? Uh, your Google Docs? Yes. N- not really. Not now. Not you, okay. you 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 can link to them. Okay. So again, there's yeah, there's several uh, workarounds when it comes to to Google Plus. But I'm just trying to get a grasp of how how you would use this in your classroom. And I really think that not being a teacher, so you would certainly be able to comment better on this than I would. But where this would really benefit you is maybe during homework, uh, if you wanted to interact with a, a few students that were having trouble um, and they wanted to do some extra credit, you could actually be part of a hangout with them and teach them uh, away from the school. Mm-hmm. So they would be able to uh, have this on at home. Now, of course, they're going to have to have their parents' approval and that kind of thing. But I could definitely see a huge advantage to this as a teacher being able to – basically be in their living room with them after hours it, helping them out you know i know my daughter had gone through tutoring where she would go to to school after after hours and there would be you know teachers and teacher assistants to help you could create your own uh tutoring right straight from your home or your office to their home using a hangout that's a good possibility yeah you know, i'm just thinking here you know, as a music teacher, and you have, you said nine people, or is it nine plus yourself in a hangout, I would love to see if I can get people in different rooms or different locations playing the same piece at the same time and then record it to see if it actually can sync up and sound like a, sound like an orchestra piece. Now, that would be exciting. Um, well, you could certainly record it. Uh, however, the one thing about a hangout is the loudest person dominates the room unless oh. you control... The microphone. So, for example, if you have, like you mentioned, nine people, there's a, it's ten people that could be in a hangout, but of course you have to include yourself in that ten, so you have nine additional people. So if you were to have, um, you know, ten people playing instruments, the loudest person's going to be the one that takes over the microphone. Does, does that make sense? That makes sense a lot. Yes. Okay, okay. And I don't know if your audience quite understands, so I'll try and elaborate, but what happens is Google has created this Hangout format that's so smart that it picks up the person that's talking or making noise, and it goes straight to their video feed and their audio feed. So if we're having a conversation and everybody's talking, it's going to jump around like you're changing your TV channels. So generally, people are quiet until they have something to say. When they speak, their video and their audio becomes front and center on the screen. And and so I think to get ten people playing, I'm not a hundred percent sure that would work in a hangout. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about what, what uh one of the buzzwords here is plus one, and I'm seeing these plus ones pop up. Um, what are they, and how do we how how could we use them to to our advantage? I've actually been doing some research on plus one as well. Uh, you know, obviously I'm playing catch up as much as everybody else is, is here trying to learn each day. But the best way I can describe plus one is if you are already using like for your Facebook, it basically says that you like this post. So you're saying if, if I find a post by Jeff Bradbury and I decide that I'm going to one plus that, 
it makes it more popular. Now, there's a thing called Sparks, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will. And also, Google is known for being the largest search engine on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. So as many, the more one pluses you get, the best I understand this is that it gets you a higher rank in the search engine, certainly in Sparks, but in your search engines. And it also allows you to... If you want to save a stream, for example, say you want to um, be able to find something that you were interested in or you posted in, by one plusing it, it adds you to the stream without making a comment. So if you don't want to take the time to say, oh, I want to write a comment here, nice article, Jeff, uh, talk to you later, I just hit one plus, I am now part of that stream. Okay. So I can go back and I can look under my notifications, which pops up in the upper right-hand corner in a red dialog box. When I click that, it'll say, you won plus this post. So I can go back later and look at, see what post that was and decide if I want to save it out and look at it and see all the additional comments. So it does a few things. It also gets you involved in the post without actually having to comment. You just hit that one plus button and you're now involved in that post. I'm seeing these little one pluses pop up an awful lot. I, I stuck one on the teacher cast page. I, I think I'm up to plus four now. And, yeah. And I thought that was great until I looked at some of these other sites and they're up to 1.2K. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we're com- we are small players in a big market. And when you have people like Mashable out there and, uh, you know, Leo Laporte and, and all the, you know, Dignation, the big dogs, they're going to get hit a lot more than we are. Mm-hmm. Um, and, th- and that's just the nature of the business. They have a staff of 200 people working, and I'm imagining you work alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you do this at night and uh, whenever your family allows and you to. And, and the sun yeah. comes up and down, yeah. Right. So what we're, I, I don't want to say competing because I'm not trying to get to their level, but those folks have entire staffs. And I, I don't want to get on that rant, but th- their motivation is different than ours. Jeff, you are truly trying to help a specific group. You want to help your kids, and you want to help teachers use the Internet. That, to me, is something I'll support every single day of the week. You're not doing this for money. You're not doing this for sponsorship. I mean, we all need sponsors to keep going because this costs us money. I totally understand that, but you're not driven by that. These other you know, websites, they are driven by money and by listeners, and they'll do whatever they can to get them and not necessarily offer sometimes the greatest biased help because they're being paid to talk about a certain product. Where I would trust Jeff Bradbury's site more because I know I'm going to get Jeff Bradbury's opinion. If Jeff Bradbury says, I like to use ScreenFlow or I like to use Wiretap, I believe it because I know you're using it. You're not getting paid to say that. So anyway, there's my little rant about <laughs> big uh, big corporations in podcasting. <laughs> getting back to Google Plus a little bit. Um, right. y- we, we were talking with the Hangouts and stuff as ways to help tutoring and stuff, and, and I'm looking at this word huddles. Could you describe a little bit of what is a huddle? Um, okay, well, a huddle is – it's SMS. It's basically text for uh, – for Google Plus. So you're able to use it on your iOS device or your Android phone and text back and forth on Google Plus's network. Okay. Yeah. And and is there I I recently saw that for Android, I think they have an iPhone or they there's an Android app and there's an iPhone app, correct? Correct. Yep. Yep. And so one would assume that the iPad app is just around the corner, right? Yeah, uh the iPod Touch and the iPad, this will not work. I don't know why yet. Um, that's oh. been a very common question, but I, I really don't know what's going on. I'm pulling up as we speak here my um, my app. So, okay, on my I have an iPhone, so I'm an iOS guy. I have Stream, Photos, Circles, Profile, and then I have one additional new button, and it's called Huddle. So when I click on Huddle, it has all the conversations I've had recently, and it's just a text message. So I click on it. I can actually start a new text message or continue with a text message with somebody else. This does not go to the computer, though. This is only phone to phone. Now, there is talk about integration of having Huddle 
on the interface, but it hasn't happened as of yet. Okay, so and, if, and if I want to ju- huddle with somebody, I have to hit the button. Okay, I see what I'm doing. Type in the name or the email. Okay. And just as we're talking, Jeff, I have Google Plus up right now, just because I like to have it up while we're talking. There, An article just came out. Google Plus app for iOS updated to add iPad and iPod Touch support. So you're hearing it here live. Wow, that is good. And it's it's right here. So I'm actually saving, which I should – well, that's that's probably for a different show. But (laughs) how to save this article. So you just say link to post, and then you add to your bookmarks. And now I've got that post for later. So his one thing with the stream you'll notice is that the stream flies by pretty darn quick if you're following a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll miss an article. And if you want to keep that article, there's a little disclosure triangle in the upper right-hand corner of other people's posts. And it says link to post. Once you click that, you get the link to that specific post. And then you're able to save that out. Now, there's no repository yet built into Google+, Plus, which I'm sure there will be. But there is a workaround where you create a bookmark, and then you just simply say add to the Google Plus posts, which okay. is what I created, and then I add to that. So that's how you save your posts. And, and I'm looking at iTunes now, and there it is, an update to my Google Plus app. Yep. Five and a half megs. Um, yep. I don't know if this is a silly question or not, but does Google Plus play with other apps? Can I post something on Google Plus and have it shoot out to Twitter? Not as of yet, and they have not released the API. There are some companies that are doing some hacks, and I would be very weary of those. We just had on episode 10 uh, Hessel from HT Applications on our last uh, Google Plus show, and he is a mobile app developer. And he talked about releasing the APIs. Google has not made those APIs available to developers yet. So the, the people that are out there saying you can integrate into Twitter, which it's being done, but it's not very stable. And I don't know all the details because I'm not an app developer behind that, uh, but it's apparently they're finding a way in and they're integrating it. Once Google Plus – or I'm sorry, Google allows the API to be released to developers – so they have the code that they need to integrate. It will be available to say whatever you post on Google Plus goes to your Twitter and vice versa or to Facebook or to LinkedIn or to whatever social network you're involved in. I think that's still coming. Okay. And, yeah. and, I, and I, I mentioned this at the top of the show, but did Google give a date yet of when it's going to be officially released? I mean, they're already up to like 25 million users, but – they did. They said July 31st, and it didn't happen. Uh, so I don't know for sure. Um, it should be soon. But if you remember when Google, when Gmail came out, it was in beta for two years. Got so you. Google is one of those companies that really just takes their time releasing it to the public. So I could see it hitting 100 million users and still be in beta. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm very impressed with the service. I, I've only started using it. You know, I want to say thank you again for letting me on the show a couple of times. I, I have three more points before we wrap this up that sure. people are asking me about. Um, the first one is, can I use Google Plus as my 100% everyday blogger? And I've seen people talk about things on TVs and, and on different podcasts of, you know, they're giving up on their WordPress accounts and they're giving up on whatever – they're just completely posting their blog on Google+. Plus. Um, should we, as teachers, continue to blog and use these other sites? Do you see Google+, Plus being the only place that we, that we would want to post? I personally don't, and I know Kevin Rose made that jump, and he's a very popular internet provider and content creator uh, from Dig. And I don't know if it was more of a publicity stunt for him doing that. But I think you still need a home page. And the reason I say that is because what we just mentioned about not being able to always get to your stream. So if you are posting, now you could go to your profile and find what you're posting. But if you want to create something and have an organized uh, section, for example, you, you want to have different areas of your blog They're not going to allow you to do that on Google+. It's going to be one long stream, and people are going to have to search 
by scrolling down, where in your blog, you're able to have tags, you're able to have a search box, you're able to have different categories and drop down tabs. I still think you need some kind of home page where everybody knows where you live. So if it's teachercast.net or jeffbradbury.com or you know xyz.com, I still think you need to own some space on the web other than Google+. Plus. I, I disagree with having your blog. Now, I, I do agree to post as much as you can on Google+, Plus, but you whatever you post on Google+, Plus, I continue to post over at googleplustoday.net. I still think you need a presence online. Hmm. I think that's a good point. I, I, I'm running into an awful lot of teachers who are, you know, they're bloggers nowadays and, and, and they're teaching their classes how to blog and they're having, you know, 20 minutes before the bell rings at the end of the day, everybody has to blog something. I, I guess in trying to make this as easy as possible for teachers to use and for students to pick up during the classroom, um, are you finding that the simplest way to use this is by logging on to Google or are you finding any third party apps that are integrating that can just pop up and make a Google post and pop back out? Not yet. Everything is on Google Plus. So, uh, yeah, I always have a Google Plus page running. Now, one of the real things that they need to fix, and, and this has been the number one request, according to Bradley Horowitz, who's the project manager over at Google, is the multiple sign-in. Now, we did do a uh, post on how to make fast switching available, but when I signed up for G+, I was so excited to get in that I used an account that I really didn't want to use for for my Google Plus uh, website. So I have to switch accounts. So if I'm going to be working on my calendar or my docs, we have a Google Voice line now and I want to check the voicemail, I have to log out of that and then log back in. And you can't change your primary Gmail name. So this is kind of a long-winded answer here, but I always have that site open and I'll have a second computer to do my other things that I have to log into my other Google account because I have multiple Google accounts. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, yeah. The other questions that people have been asking me for, um, should we be thinking, and you might have already answered this one, but should we be thinking of Google Plus as our web page? Uh, well, we just kind of talked about that, and I, I would say no. I would say you still need a page of your own that you call home that you go to, and it's teachercast.net. And everybody knows when they go to teachercast.net, they're going to find all your content in an organized manner. It's all searchable. It's all linked. It has different tabs for all the different areas of your site. But yet you continue to post it on your Google+. And then every time I make a post over on Google+, I add my link to the web page to find more information. So usually I'll just give a snippet. I'll just say, you know, just created a new tutorial on XYZ. Visit googleplustoday.net slash XYZ for more information. And then that gives, you know, just a quick snippet. People see it. If they're interested, they head over to my website and check out more information. Because chances are nobody's going to read during, you know, a stream an entire blog post. It's, it's going to pass by too fast and... Uh, I would rather have a website that I call home where I know everything lives. Mm -hmm. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about Internet safety. Um, There's a lot of talk back and forth about sites like MySpace and Facebook and the educational community. I've had principals come onto the show and say, absolutely not. Facebook is not. I would not allow my kids to go on there. And I've had I've seen a lot of articles come out of why your school district needs to have a Facebook. Um, Not that we're really going to constantly keep comparing Google to Facebook, but I guess then the question, Dennis, of of Internet safety, how do we keep our students safe on Google Plus if anybody can just join a circle or join a hangout or post? Um, What are your thoughts and suggestions like that? I I know you have a, a, a... a child that's on Google Plus, and how do we keep our kids safe? That's a, a very good question. It's very broad, and the answer I have for it is basically 
for everything you do online. And it's just being smart in general. Don't click on links that you don't know where they come from. Uh, if you're not sure about somebody, for example, this is going to be a real tough answer, and I don't want to go too long. But for, let me let me first say just general internet security, especially with children. Don't allow children to have a computer in their own room. And I know that sounds kind of like maybe tough parenting, but you know that's sometimes how you have to be. Have the computer in a central location where you can take a look over their shoulder occasionally to see who they're talking to and exactly what's going on. So by having the computer in your living room where everybody's cooking and cleaning and watching television and having conversations – it's safe and you can, you're able to watch it and make that a rule in your home that you do not log in to MySpace, Google Plus, or Facebook when you're in your own room. I'm sorry, but that has to be the rule. Then you can also follow them. And I used to have a MySpace account just to follow my children and see what they were up to. Now, they're smarter than we are, <laughs> so they could get they can do workarounds. But I think that's one general safety uh, concern is to just have that computer in an area where you can monitor what they're doing. But just basic general rules is if you don't know somebody or if you don't know the link, if you get it in email, don't open it. And a lot of times you can hover over uh, the link and it will show you where that link's going to take you because with things like Bitly and they can make links anything and all of a sudden you're in a site that you don't want to be in. Uh, we don't need to talk about what the content is. I think we all know um, and it could be bad. It could be a virus. Now, most viruses require more involvement. You have to do more things but some people do get caught up in those kind of things. But I think if, if, for example, if if in Google Plus specifically, if I see a post come up from somebody that I don't know and he wants me to click on this link to take him to a different web page, I'm going to click on him first because you have the ability to see who posted that and learn a little bit about this guy. Has he gotten any bad reviews? Has anybody had some bad things to say about him? What is his posting history? And then it's, if it seems like it's okay, then I might continue to click on it. There's just some kind of general safety things you have to always be concerned about. And I think it's more of a gut than anything, Jeff. You just know people you can trust and people that you can't. And I wouldn't click on anything that I didn't trust, that's for sure. And with children in particular, there is a reason why they set an age limit. I don't know exactly what it is, if it's 16 or 18, but they won't even let you in. My, my daughter actually doesn't have a G-plus account. She gets on my account. So then that way I can monitor everything she does. But we have three accounts, like I, like I had mentioned <laughs> before. Um, so, you know, just in general, there's just uh, some good safety practices. Just make sure you know where you're going. Um, if if 1Password is an application that I don't want to get too far sidetracked here, but is an application that will not allow you to go. So if somebody sends you a link and you click on it and 1Password realizes it's not the correct link, it's a phishing scam, they won't let you go to that website. So it's there's several ways to protect yourself, and this could be a, a topic that I'd love to come back on and discuss on another show because we could talk about an hour just on Internet security. But it's to. basically just being smart online and understanding what you're clicking on and don't just click away and agree to things before you actually read them and make sure you know what you're getting involved in. I think that's a lot of good advice. And, of course, yeah. we would love to have you come back on the show sometime and talk Internet safety. I, I know you've got a lot of talk about how to do things and and I would love to have you come back on the show with another topic I know you like I know so many times as teachers you know we have stuff at our home we have stuff at school I, I would love to Dennis have you come on and just talk about backing up your material oh yeah yeah security and backup are two things I'm passionate about and I'm kind of refraining from going on a rant here so <laughs> I don't want I know we're probably you know well over a half hour and um but, yeah, I would come back in a heartbeat to talk about security and backing up because those are the two most important things you can do. You don't want to have your machine uh, violated by some hacker. And if you do, at least have a backup from when before the hacker got you. You can go back and restore your machine. That is some good advice. Yeah. Um, last question, a little bit off topic, but one that uh, we've been discussing a lot 
on the show here, and that's uh, data transfers. Um, What's your point of view? Should we be encouraging our students to get flash drives? Should we be encouraging or, I don't want to say forcing, but should we be, you know, just as we have to go out and get pencils and notebooks, come into school in September with a Dropbox account? Um, Where do you see things these days as far as data transfer? How does your... How does your daughter take information back and forth? Um, Well, you know, that's uh, mostly with flash drives or thumb drives, as we call them, just because they haven't really gotten to that status yet where they understand Dropbox. I think iCloud's going to make a big difference when they release that. Mm -hmm. Um, It really just depends on the level of experience to the computer user. I've tried getting people on Dropbox that just cannot get it and not get a grasp on it. We've done a pretty a couple of pretty good tutorials over at yourmacshow.com that explain Dropbox. I am a huge Dropbox fan. So personally, yes, I share all of my documents between all of my sh- machines. I used to use Chronosync, and it would sync all my machines' data back and forth. Well, that was a waste of $50. Now with uh, Dropbox, I simply have my home folder live in my Dropbox, and it syncs between all machines. And if you're not sure what Dropbox is... It is a cloud-based storage solution. Any modifications you make to a file, it goes down and and comes across any computer you have, Windows, your iPhone, your iPad, or Mac. It'll sync that document to every machine. Uh, I love Dropbox. I don't use thumb drives anymore. The only thing that I use uh, the external hard drives for is to back up. And I have a time capsule that I back up to wirelessly so I don't have to think about it. And then I always have two hard drives right next to my machine that I use to back up. And then I put one off-site. But as far as moving data back and forth, never use. I never use a thumb drive anymore. It's all done through Dropbox. It's all electronic. Dennis, I would really appreciate it sometime if you would come on and, and talk more about that. I, I know over at your Mac show you've got a lot of good things to data storage. Um, just in wrapping up, thank you so much for being on the show today, Dennis. Oh, it was an honor to be here, Jeff. Thanks. So I really uh, dig what you're doing here with TeacherCast.net. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, could you tell us how do we find you? You know, uh, absolutely. I'm over at GooglePlusToday.net. You'll find me frequently on Google Plus Today as Dennis Freitas. And if you want to learn a little bit more about me, go to my about.me page slash Dennis Freitas, and everything I do on the internet is right there. Thank you so much, Dennis. You bet, Jeff. Thanks for having me. And thank you for listening for the TeacherCast podcast. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, teachercast.net, to your friends and colleagues, and check us out on Twitter at the screen name TeacherCast. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts and app reviews that are beneficial to you, the 21st Century Educator. This has been a TeacherCast production. Join us next time for another edition of the TeacherCast podcast. Podcast.